Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever or whenever you are. This is the Lightning Podcast, where we discuss and explore the weekly meditations without necessarily reaching any conclusions. Welcome. I'm your host, Cyrus Polysbon, and I'm joined today by Anne Dudek, Zohar Adkins, Stuart Alsop III, and Nicolas Sarian. Welcome, everybody. I'd like to remind everyone watching or listening that if you want to join our WhatsApp group, Chronicles, to discuss the meditations yourselves, the link is in the bio. And if you would like and comment on this video, that would be wonderful as well, because that would mean more people to discuss the meditations in Chronicles. All right. Now, on to the meat and potatoes. The quote of the day is by Kalidasa from The Recognition of Shakuntala, and it reads, The darkness of the night that the sun is powerless to dispel, the moon can drive away. Nico, could you explain to us the origin of that quote and the author? Yes, perhaps our Indian audience would, would recognize who Kalidasa is and who, and what the recognition of Shakuntala is, but basically for everybody else, um, Kalidasa is, is to Sanskrit or to the ancient Indian literature called Kavya, what Virgil is to Latin. So we're talking about like the major poet of a tradition here. And the text, the recognition of Shakuntala is very important because beyond it, and like beyond it, what it means for the, the literary tradition of India, it was discovered in the 19th century by German Indologists and it became very, it was a big deal because the recognition of Shakuntala is basically a tragedy, like a, a Greek, Greek tragedy. So probably the, there was the Scheller brothers were the ones who, who made a lot of work on this back in the 19th century. But the idea being that you find tragic tropes in other traditions, this being the Indian tradition. And we can talk about what tragedy is in the essence of tragedy. The quote we have today is in a sense, isolated from the whole play, from the whole story. Mm-hmm. But the idea is that it's not a happy ending. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to summarize, I could summarize the whole play, but that will be the main idea is that there's a scheme to, to the whole story which mimics or it's similar to, let's say, a play by Sophocles or by Aeschylus. What is the allegorical or symbolic meaning of the quote, either in the context of the play or as a standalone? Though? How do you think about these elements, the darkness of the night, the sun, and the moon? So um, I'm going to go at it through a nice, as an isolated quote, because I don't remember exactly from what part of the play I got it. But it, it is po- poetic, first of all. That's one thing. If I have to interpret this on a totally personal level, like the idea, hmm, I don't want to get a, a chemical as we always do. <laughs> but uh, there, there is something to be said about the light of the moon versus the light of the sun here. And I actually wanted to bring this, I wanted to bring this up, but it's, I'm a bit embarrassed. I'm, I'm a terrible poet. I, I don't like, I don't entertain poetic writing myself that much because I think it, writing poetry today is, is a, I, I take it as a bit of a narcissistic <laughs> endeavor, but I do have, I have a short, it's not really a poem, but it's more of a room, personal rumination where I have this idea that goes something like, it's in Spanish originally. So in English, it would be the perimeter of the sun, sorry, the perimeter of the moon is more sharp than the perimeter of the sun. And what would be a better translation of that would be... The edge of the moon? Exactly. The edge of the moon is sharper than the edge of the sun. So you can look at the moon and you can see its borders very clearly, right? When you look at the sun, you can't do that. Or it's diffused. And there's a few things connected there with the idea of staring at the sun versus staring at the moon. Who stares at the moon, right? Everyone? <laughs> I, I, I stare at the moon. You stare at the moon? Yeah. It's like, the, it's like the night versus the daylight, the moon versus the sun. It's funny because staring at the sun is a form of insanity. Staring at the moon also is a form of insanity as well. I remember okay. I, I went to Lunacy. this yoga. Exactly. Yeah. 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 
I, I went to this yoga training. I can't remember where I, where I got the specific training. There was one point at which I, I might have discussed this on the show previous times. There was one point at which I started getting um, my yoga uh, methods from Google itself. I would just start to search Google uh, for yoga methods. Uh, and it was a horrible idea. It was a really bad idea because I got myself into all sorts of esoteric traps with all sorts of negative um, uh, effects that I didn't see. And one of which was to stare at the moon on the full moon as the object of meditation and that was quite a, I'll leave what happened after for a different show, but, but it's, <laughs> quite, uh, it's quite, okay. Can I get in on the action here? Go. Yeah, please. Yeah. I want to talk about the, the light of the sun and the light of the moon in, in Jewish tradition. And also this idea of the sun being a source of clarity versus the moon being a source of luminosity. Descartes famously for those who know is one of the, one of the first to try to describe the scientific method. And he, he thinks that the job of philosophy and science is to find things that are clear and distinct. That's his phrase. The sun is a kind of representation of clear and distinct. I think the moon is not distinct and not clear. In the light that it provides, and obviously the moon also can wax and wane, we can disappear entirely. But what you get in, in, from the moon is the glow of the darkness around the moon. I think that's to Nico's point about the, prim, the sharpness of the perimeter. And on the eve before Passover, Jews search their homes for leavened bread. It's the last thing you do before Passover is you search for leavened bread in your house. And if you find any, you burn it the next morning. And you're supposed to search with a candle rather than a torch. And to this day, now we have electricity, people search in the dark for this chamet, it's called this, this leavened bread, because you're not allowed to have leavened bread in your possession for eight days. When the Israelites left Egypt, they didn't have time for their bread to rise. And as a symbol of leaving in haste and having to eat this sort of, this unfinished bread, that's why, just why Jews eat matzah for eight days on Passover. So you're not even allowed to possess bread-like objects during Passover, but you search for this bread with a candle and it seems highly inefficient to say the least, because if the, if the purpose of finding the bread if it's so important to find the bread, why wouldn't you just turn on the lights or why wouldn't you use a blazing torch? Why would you use a candle? And I'm going to emphasize the question even more intensely by saying that it's such a grave sin. I say sin in scare quotes, but it's such a grave sin to have bread in your possession during Passover. If you deliberately have bread in your possession during Passover, it's you're writing yourself out of the story. And the, the punishment is that you're cut off from your people and you lose your sort of share in the afterlife and all kinds of things seems disproportionate. But the point of it is that this is such a fundamental story that relating to the story in such a deep way determines whether you're in or you're out of the story. And the way that you participate is by cleansing yourself of bread. And so given that, given how high the stakes are, why search with a candle rather than a torch? Or why not search, it, to use this metaphor, with the sun, with the light of the sun in broad daylight rather than at night. And the answer given by the Talmud or suggested by the Talmud is that the purpose of the search isn't actually to find the bread, it's to light up the darkness. The preparation, the final preparation isn't the success of the search. You've already done all, you've already done all the searching up until that moment. So if you're actually looking for bread at that moment, then you're not doing it right. The, the capstone, the milestone for, for completing the search is no longer to search in a practical way, but to search specifically in this more obscure way. That's what I thought of when I heard this phrase that the, that the darkness of the night, that the sun is powerless to dispel, the moon can drive away, is that the moonlight, much like the candlelight, is a not, it's not utilitarian. It's not functional. It doesn't actually help you see in a clear and distinct way, but it does allow you to see the power of light contrasted with dark in a way that the overpowering torch or the overpowering sun does not allow. And so what that means now to just hit it home is that essentially you have with light, you have an absolute 
basis and a relative basis. Same with value. If I say, what's the value of something? You can say on absolute terms or on relative terms. Like a dollar is, has an absolute value, but it also has a relative value to a, a poor person versus a billionaire. A dollar is worth more or less depending on the utility of that dollar. So on an absolute basis, we can say that the light of the sun is better than the light of the moon. It's more powerful. But on a relative basis, the light of the moon is more powerful than the light of the sun because the light of the moon allows us to see the darkness, whereas the light of the sun does not allow us to see the darkness. And the reason why it's important to see the darkness is because from that, you can actually see the power of the light. Whereas when you don't see the darkness, you don't even realize the power of the light. So I'll pause on that and curious what Anne thinks from like a design and like color theory and other perspective on this. Not but... Yeah, I think I really understood it in the idea of like explicitness, right? And so mm. even outside the physical reality, the light perception, I think especially in art, it's making things explicitly known versus implicitly understanding them. And I think I've mentioned on the podcast before, like my own depression and how I navigate that. And I think that the sunlight is reading medical text on depression and getting this very explicit, very illuminated, like understanding of depression. And then the moonlight is, I would say, going and, and looking at a Rothko painting and allowing myself mm -hmm. to feel all of his emotions that he had, especially at the end, towards the end of his life. And kind of finding power in looking at something from the side or looking at it in moonlight where you seek other methods of understanding rather than this explicit knowledge. And so I think it's much similar to what you just talked about, Zohar, where I think artists love the moon and especially Nico, as you read more poetry on your days off, find a lot of them talking about the moon. <laughs> And it's because, like, how do you describe love, like, in explicit words? It's not going to, that's sunlight. That's not going to happen. But moonlight can shed some understanding on what it feels like to be in love or in hate types of things. Mm. In, in Genesis, it says that God made two great lights, I believe. Or it says that God made, made great lights. And there's a, a commentary on this, which is, what were the great lights that God made? And one of, there's an amazing Talmudic passage on this that says that the great lights were the sun and the moon. And so then we are, there's a dialogue between the sun and the moon that's imagined where the moon says to God, how can there be two great lights? There should only be one great light. Like it's the equivalent of how can there be two kings? And God says, you're right, now diminish yourself. And that's how the moon became small. And also, as we know, the, the light of the moon is literally just a reflection of the, the light of the sun. It doesn't have its own light, direct, it, its own independent light. Unfortunately, the moon is a, it's a satellite, if you will. And then the moon says, in response, something to the extent of, it doesn't seem fair that I should be diminished, like simply for asking a good question. Like I pointed out a truism about the way of things. And now because I did that, like you're exiling me. And God says, like I never said, I, I'm interpolating a little bit, but I never said that being diminished is a bad thing. That's your shtick. That's your value judgment. Look at all of these characters throughout the Bible who are referred to as the small and what great giants they are. And so you have like actually your work as the moon is to appreciate the contribution, the great contribution that you can make from the place of diminishment. So don't discount the side hustle or the side angle or to Anne's point, like the, you don't have to be the main show to get the glory. There's a, there's a, in some ways more power for power, more Delta, more opportunity from, from being in the position of the underdog or being in the position of the little one. I was actually, I was talking to a friend who works in finance and he said, um, about a company, I won't mention which one that has really good margins. I think their margins are like 80% or something like this. And he said, what's bad about that? And I tried to think of an answer. What is bad about having such good margins? And he says, the fact that they can't get better. And thus you can't assign 
a valuation multiple to the company on the theory that they can improve their margins because their margins are already quite exceptional. Even if they get them up another 5%, it's not going to be the driver. So I think that's where we might say about the sun is you get it already. Yeah, we get it. Like the sun, it's awesome. Whereas the moon, because it's discounted, has this opportunity to surprise us. Yeah, I actually, another thought I had when reading this quote was like the idea of hard and soft power in politics. And especially like hard power would be this military, this sunlight, this kind of thing. But then soft power, honestly, I thought of South Korea and the rise of K-dramas, the rise of K-pop and like how much this has brought attention and commerce and all these things to South Korea. And yeah, I think it's this idea that to your point, Zohar, that the biggest and the brightest is not always what's necessary in certain situations. It's not the only way to achieve power or nation or knowledge or things like that. The, is there an, another way to interpret the, the quote about the moon? You mentioned at, at near the beginning, Zohar, like the moon isn't always the same waxes and wanes and sometimes it's not even there uh, but it is there what if the quote is it's about the fact that the moon is there when the sun isn't so maybe the darkness of the night the sun is powerless to dispel is because the sun isn't there during the night by definition and it's so you, you don't and then so maybe it's saying you don't necessarily need the cavalry, you've got the moon right here. The moon will suffice. Turn to, toward the moon. In this hour, the moon will be your friend. This, the smallest comfort can work. The smallest comfort is enough. And sometimes it's the smaller things, the less important things that show up when you need them the most, when what you usually depend on isn't there. That's what I picking up on it um, i think that's i think that's a plain and, and basic interpretation in a good way right now obviously it's about to be the winter solstice so i'm also thinking about the length of days getting longer and shorter and darkness as a, also a seasonal thing obviously that's why we have hanukkah and christmas and kwanzaa and so many and in ancient times saturnalia so many festivals of light in the winter pick up on this idea that it's not just the specific darkness that people find to be uncomfortable, but actually a kind of like the prospect of darkness as this ongoing thing. And how will, how will we ever get to spring again? If, if it was just a night of darkness, we could deal with it, but it's the shortening of the days and then the continuing darkness day over day, where you can think of darkness as a kind of sustained period of time, not just as the, not just as the darkness of, a, let's say, an, an evening, but the darkness as a kind of phase, a phase of life. And so what do you do in that time? You summon the power of the moon. You summon the power of the small light, the, not the magnificent light, but the little light. And that actually, in a weird way, is comforting. If you think of Christmas lights, there's something very beautiful about that. And if people just, again, to my point before, like you have football field lights and baseball field lights uh, for night, if that was the response, it wouldn't be as powerful as, in a way, these tiny lights where you all of a sudden actually feel the significance of these things that aren't significant that seem on their own insignificant there's just like a spiritual requirement to see ourselves as significant precisely in a moment of darkness precisely in a moment of days getting shorter which su suggests that the world is ending and that our days are numbered and all of that and um again just to, just to, because i'm in hanukkah mode right now thinking about this the um the talmud has a has another story about um, Adam, the, f the first human being, who imagine you were the first human being and you didn't know anything about seasons. Like you've just been created and now all of a sudden for the first time you experience the shortening of days. Wouldn't you be super freaked out? So Adam has just eaten from the tree of knowledge and has been punished, right, for doing so. It's been he and, and Eve have been 
cast out of Eden, they were told by God that on the day that they eat from the tree of knowledge, they shall surely die. And now Adam's looking around wondering, okay, when's my death sentence? And the days are getting shorter. And oh, I guess this is it. And gets super anxious. And then realizes after the winter solstice that no, the days are getting long again. And it's passing. And so the next year, and there's a difference of opinion on this, but the next year basically invents Hanukkah or some proto-Hanukkah invents a festival of light as a way of either celebrating the fact that he made it through the previous year and he survived, or perhaps, as we say on, on Twitter, as a cope, as a coping mechanism to feel that even though it, it looks like you're dying, don't worry, you're not dying. So that's what the light represents. And maybe that's what the moonlight provides as well as a sense of, I know it's very scary, but the, like wink, like you'll get through this. Yeah. yeah. And oh, Stuart, were you going to say something? So I want to go back to that seasons. The idea of seasons is really interesting for me because for the past, since 2019 and a lot of my twenties, I was essentially living in places where the seasons were very different from my homeland. Um, lots of times in tropical countries, but for the past four years, I've been, uh, spending the summer in the Northern hemisphere and then spending the summer in the winter he hemisphere and essentially a, a constant constant the summer. Of the summer yeah and and so now this year is the first time that i fully made the transition over into the southern hemisphere and so my summer is now your winter and it is playing some big tricks on my mind because in my biology i'm on winter time right now and everybody in my network is on winter time right now but i'm on summer days days are getting longer like now this is great so it's a definitely and that ties in with the moon too, because you can track the sun. I, I know that I know the path that the sun is going to go on every day in my hometown. I know where the light comes into my house in the morning, but I have no idea what's happening in the moon. It's total chaos. And also I the, the summer. Okay. I think it's that like the moon is commonly associated with tragedy. Like in a lot of stories, the moon is feminine and the reason it waxes and wanes is piece of it were stolen or like some nefarious activity, like this tragedy that led to the waxing and the waning of the moon. I'm not super familiar with this text, but does like the moon and its association with tragedy and this quote play into the poetry here or the larger narrative of the story? No, to be honest, I think this <laughs> is a standalone, but I, I'll, I'll give you a, a nice explanation of something else, which I think ties to. I think this is just a, and, and there's a play and someone says something and someone throws some sort of poetic wisdom into the mix. And that's the way this quote is working in the text. But what I wanted to say is that, especially in like the Ro ancient Roman and the Greek context, we know, we, we normally, you said lunacy, right? At the beginning of the, Zohar said lunacy, and we talked about like the symbolism of the moon as being connected to insanity or to like madness because the night, no, that's where like we dream, we can't see clearly things. But the interesting thing is that for the ancient Romans and the Greeks, night was not the time of lunacy or let's say of insanity or of madness. It was actually noon. Noon was the, yeah, I have a book right here that I was like, it's called the demons of the, of the, of the known. And French author from the 20th century. And they, but they, and so at noon, that's the time of insanity. And I, I feel like that. my life is a little bit like that. <laughs> I'm a night person. <laughs> but but why? Why? Right, why? Exactly. Because and this is a beautiful idea and it makes a lot of sense because when the sun is up, like, I, I perpendicular, like 90%, 90 degrees up noon, you can't see your shadow. And you that, can, you cannot see your you shadow. Can, you cannot see your shadow. There's no, there's no contrast mm -hmm. as you were saying initially, there is no clear distinction between what is dark and what is bright. And that points back to the edge of the moon is clearer than the edge of the sun. And you can get Jungian about this because what happens when you can't see your shadow? Uh, wait, did I tell you guys about the shadow of the shadow? Oh, wow. I'm excited. Yeah. Just to wrap it up. There is this, you know, there is this kind of a popular association between clarity and darkness, the sun and the moon, 
a male and a female, right? Because Sol, Sol and Luna, this is an alchemy also, but like the feminine versus the masculine. But I don't know, I feel attuned to this idea that madness happens at noon, not at midnight. <laughs> the Talmud is full of hey. demonology. So <laughs> we can do with that, we can do with that what we will. We can view it as a construct or a kind of play, or you can imagine that they actually believed in demons and just had a completely different worldview than ours. You can, I'm not going to get into the, what is a demon? The sort of the, <laughs> the history of how it was the case that for a long time, people did believe in demons and what those were just as they believed in angels. You can obviously read Dan Brown's novels as well to think about that, but you can also ask, what are the angels and demons of our time? But nonetheless, there's an, an what, so there's an anthropology of demons. That's called demonology, which is like what makes a demon. And the Talmud loves asking these kinds of questions in addition to what makes a demon. Also, how do you discover if something is or isn't a demon? And in this discussion, there's a suggestion that human beings and demons both cast shadows, but demons do not have a shadow of a shadow. Again, you can, what is a shadow of a shadow? You might be able to go to Wikipedia and look up penumbra or their parallax. There's various scientific sort of discussions about shadows that cast shadows and the physics of it. And you can actually see examples of it in, in photography of shady rooms that have different shades within shades and all that kind of thing. But I think about it more evocatively as the shadow of the shadow. If it is the thing that humans have, but demons don't, it's like this thing that's super subtle. That is the receipt the material receipt that's barely material that suggests the difference between a soul and a non-soul. I think that's very interesting also in light of AI discussions. Uh, you often hear people, especially on the doomer de decelerationist side of the culture war, so to say, but AI doesn't have a soul and therefore it's not going to be able to do X, Y, and Z. And without wading into the ontology of AI, I think about maybe is the AI a demon where it can do everything that a human being can do or will be able to do one day, but it won't have a shadow of a shadow, whatever that means. In any case, that's some background to think about is just why define the human being as that which casts a shadow's shadow, but the demon as not. So I'll be curious for your thoughts on that, but I have to give you one piece of information on this first, which is when a person is looking for, what's the word, like a sign or an omen, as to how their year is going to go, there's various things that they can look for. And generally this gets into sort of sorcery and uh, prophecy and all kinds of things that are like, might be pagan and might be problematic from a strictly monotheistic <laughs> point of view, but it's still in the Talmud as yeah, people engaged in this and maybe it's okay or whatever. I, again, I'm not going to weigh in on the details. So there's a story about a man who want, is about to undertake a large journey. And he wants to know if his journey is going to go well. And so they suggest that if he wants a sign that he should go into a dark house. And if he sees a shadow of a shadow, then I believe that is a positive omen for his journey. But this is my favorite part of the story. It's so unlikely that he will find the shadow of the shadow. Because after all, how do you find a shadow of a shadow in a dark home? <laughs> completely dark home. So he shouldn't do it. He shouldn't go looking for the sign because if he fails to find the omen, he will fall into a despair and then his journey won't go well and it will become a kind of self-fulfilling, terrible journey. Even though I think the text offers this idea that there are omens and they're real, it also gives practical advice, which is, hey, maybe you don't want to get too neurotic about looking for omens because if you don't get the omen you want, that's going to lead to a psychological state that will itself have consequences. So maybe just suspend your view of how magical reality is and just focus on what you can do to make the journey a good journey. And don't worry too much about whether it's going to go well for you. Because if you do, like the neurosis itself is going to make it a bad journey. Anyways, yeah. how do you no. fit the two texts together? The fact that demons don't cast a shadow of a shadow and the fact that I guess Presumably, if he's in the house and he finds the shadow of the shadow, this is like he's seeing himself or he's seeing his soul or so something positive. It's a sign of vitality, but he's not going to find it. And it's almost, okay, I'll give you my interpretation. 
If a man tries to distinguish himself from a demon, he will fail. So don't get too worried about what makes me not a demon, because in a weird way, that would turn your life into a demonic life. So just live and let live. Philosophy and theology aren't going to help you on these fundamental questions. May I, maybe AI and man are the same, but you know what? Chaim, like, go on your <laughs> journey and, and chill. No. No, I'm going to go. Uh, that to something like chill, bro. <laughs> <laughs> the unexamined life isn't worth living, but the examined right. <laughs> one may not be livable. And now I'm going to have to go. <laughs> I'm going to have to go train a GPT on giving me good omens and bad omens. I, I would say it's again it's open AI. Way. Let's see. AI is definitely not demonic for sure. Like I have a pretty clear definition for what a demon is. It's very really synthetic. It's it's a liminal being. It's, mm. it's, this is the classic of the Phoenician, right? The daemon, like in the, in the Greek, the daemon is, no? It's something that is between two worlds. And that's why Socrates had one. Like all of the wisdom of Socrates actually comes from a daemon, which yeah. is Sophia. And the moon is a liminal being as well, because it's like the sun, but obviously not the sun. It's like a, a hybrid of earth and sun. Maybe. Maybe that's the liminality of the moon is yeah. with its advantage and its source. I mean, my, my question is, is, are we liminal beings? Yes. Yes? Explain. Yes. I <laughs> never explained myself. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> I dream every day. <laughs> I may have sort of bizarre uh, philosophies in the back of my head running all the time, as many people do, but I'm more maybe open about them. But essentially, it's my belief that humans are part spirit. Some humans are part spirit, part. And some humans are full animal and that there's division in the spirit realm or there's division among humanity of how in tune some people are to, and there's nothing wrong with being a, just a pure animal, but there's some division between a large amount of human beings between spirit and human. And there's a liminal aspect to both too, because the animal may be liminal as well. So what's the definition of liminal? Something <laughs> that is cool. being in the threshold, you're defined by the capacity of going through thresholds. I think every, everything yeah. is liminal. Everything is liminal, but human beings are, our liminality includes the fact that we're aware of our liminality in yeah. a conscious way. And so animals I mean, <laughs> are not yet aware of their liminality. So they suffer the, their liminality, but they don't fashion an identity on the basis of it. Like I think, we all have names, and even though Stuart and Anne and Cyrus and Nico and Zohar are names that other people have as well, we speak from our names and we respond when our name is called. And animals are not called by their name. They're called by their category. And I know that animals do communicate with one another, but I don't think if I, were, if I had ChatGPT, seven and it could eavesdrop on the elephants and train a neural net on elephant sounds i'm not i don't think that one elephant is going to say to the other hey tom can you pass the cheese or whatever i think it's just going to say i think it's just going to pass the cheese i don't think they do hey tom you see what i'm saying yeah 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 yeah. they will so they're aware of one another they still have specific relationships but they don't they won't have they don't have names Okay, being, this is a kind of war for me. Like, I have so many things to say. About it. <laughs> so I think, I think they have a liminality, but it's not as rich as our liminality. But and I that our liminality, you, yeah. our liminality has something to do with specifically the first-person perspective tied to the names that we carry. And even in the sort of, and perhaps this is more of a male perspective here, because we talked about this before, Anne, about creation as maybe something that if you have life-giving power, that you don't feel this as much. But make a name for yourself. The idea of you, you are given a name, but you also have a reputation and you care about creating a certain legacy that's attached to your name in some way. I just, I don't think animals have projects. I don't think that the elephant says in 20 years, I want my name to be on a building. And I want, or I want to author a book because I want to be cited or, and I'm not saying that those are good. There's obviously an aspect of narcissism in it, but so for me, that's what the human liminality is, is that it's like our diamond is in a very basic way. The name as our second self 
and you have this sort of per persona that hangs around your name that you man that you manage in some way. So is the diamond the, the 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 persona the shadow of the shadow, and a demon doesn't have that because it is a shadow, waiting to be attached to someone. Demons, Demons actually live. have names, but I wonder if they care about their reputations. When God says to Abraham, go to this place that I'm going to show you, and I will make your name great. And what does that mean? And obviously, we, we refer to the Abrahamic religions to this day, suggesting that Abraham's name, in fact, is great. Like millions of people cite Abraham as the founder of their tradition. It seems like a self-fulfilling text. But in a more constrained way, God might be saying to Abraham, you're about to leave your social network. This is pre-LinkedIn. And you're going to go from being a guy that everybody knows and thinks highly of to being a stranger in another land where no one's going to know who you are and no one's going to trust you. And nobody, nobody's going to be able to check for references or see if you got referrals. But don't worry, I'm going to make your name great. Somehow, despite the fact that you'll be on your own, which is a socially vulnerable thing, your name will still emerge as something that has currency wherever you go. So yeah, I think... That's a fascinating way to think about demons, that the shadow's shadow is the name in some way. I hadn't made that connection before. Giving a Dracula vibes. Can't see him in the mirror. There's, yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting thing on this too as well, because I've, I've been watching this vampire show, and so the vampire represents an interesting relationship to the sub, which is that they get burned by the sun. Yeah. And also I think it is a counter story to the traditional enlightenment story, because I believe the enlightenment story is essentially the person that's associated with the body and mind gets annihilated by the process to enlightenment. And on the vampire, it's the opposite. The process of the body, the personhood that's associated with the body and mind also gets anni annihilated, but it gets taken over by demons or it's replaced by a demon, the de demonic presence. I can offer like one clarifying point that might serve like this distinction between this goes back to your point on the fact that there's people who only have an animal nature and people who have a spiritual nature as well. Like, I don't want to get too technical, but like when you read Hegel, no phenomenology of spirit, there is a passage or there's a few passages in the beginning of the, because all of the, especially the phenomenology part is about Geist, no spirit and the, the, the journey of Geist, no to, it's a kind of a journey of self-recognition. And one of the initial uh, stages of the Geist is you have an animal, no? And in order for the Geist to go to the next stage, the animal needs to be sacrificed. And there's a way of reading this that, if you will, the, if you will, I, I'm, I'm not going to rest on this because it's complicated. There's a few texts that are like going around my mind, but the, the idea that what we call the human is exactly the sacrifice of the animal or of the animal nature. And what does that mean? It means that, let's say, we have quote-unquote animal instincts. You get angry, you want to go and kill a person, or you're honey, you want to go and do your business with whoever, or whatever. But we abstract from that, right? We, in a sense, sacrifice the function, the instinct to do that. And there's a variety of ways of understanding this. Like, this is perhaps the origin of guilt, the origin of consciousness, in fact, also can be that as well. But to the extent that there are people who don't have any guys, I don't know, because to me, that points goes back to the whole distinction between the animal and the human, which I have a lot of problems with, because at least myself, my, my question is, do we really know what animals are up to? This goes back to the AI thing from last time. Yes. I look at the, like, this can be a stupid meme, but. Well, cats, no, people look at cats or dogs and there's, oh, and they take care of their cats and their dogs is better than they take care of other people. And I, and I, I, I think instinct, like unconsciously, or not even conscious, consciously, they, they say, like, I would love to be a cat because the cat like doesn't have to deal with all of the, the mundane and the responsibilities and all of these things. Hmm. So it's um, like a patron of the arts. Oh, I'd love to be an artist and not worry about it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I don't know. I think animals are a mystery at the end of the day, um, to, to me at least, and to the extent that they will continue to exist in the future as well as like your self originating species. Uh, Miko, have you ever seen a cat cam? Like one of those cat cams on the internet? What is that? 
people hook up little cameras to their cat's collars and yeah. they just leave the cat for the day and you, okay. can, you can go and see what the cat does. And it has this whole second life mm. out yeah. in the neighborhood. Oh, the yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Remember that funny meme of the priest reading the Bible and the cat goes into his uh, tunic and there's a party going on inside the, the, pri the priest's tunic? I think that the example of cats and dogs are unique from the category of animals because they're domesticated. So they're uniquely liminal in a way that, let's say, a jaguar yeah. or a lion is not. I did watch that Netflix special guys. about the guy that that had pet lions or whatever it was pretty oh, oh yeah pretty tiger. appalling oh uh, yeah tiger king, uh, tiger king yeah <laughs> it's still a wolf pack don't come into quite quite thing. um but it's like some animals are domesticatable and we've actually been domesticating animals for a really long time and other animals not so i don't think that the category of animal is sufficient but certainly there are animals we live among that are like extended members of the household and certainly perceive, and we can ascribe a, a certain surveillance onto them, much like religious people in ancient times imagined that God or gods were watching them. And so you can't hide from your cat, whether even if the cat isn't wearing the cam, the cat knows. But I don't think that we feel watched by, by wild animals, animals. All, but although, we did, although but we used to that's the whole point right yeah we had, we had years ago. maybe we had this this sort of relation uh, yeah uh, animals are charged they're charged but 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 heidegger would say they're charged for us meaning like ultimately whatever we say about animals however we relate to them we're relating to ourselves vis-a-vis -vis them whereas we have no intimation that they're doing the same vis-a-vis -vis us i In think okay, i have fine. something to say more this but uh, i want to talk about my emu. i want to talk about my emu pet you have an emu you pet? have an emu i have an emu and i'll just what, what, is, what is an emu an it's, emu it's like an is, the, is the second largest bird in the world and it's flightless as as the same as its cousins the ostrich which is from south america and the Rhea, which is from South America. Even be a bird at that point. What's that? Nothing. So, <laughs> I'm six foot five, and my emu is as tall as me. <laughs> and I also have goats and sheep, and those goats and sheep are highly domesticable, as Zohar was talking about. There's, they're part of the family. But the emu is this strange, charismatic bird that does not feel like it's, it has any sort of self-referential awareness whatsoever. It doesn't feel part of the family. It, it's really awkward when I come and touch it. It's no, it's not like friendly or anything like that. And they're, they can be very dangerous and they can either be socialized or not. If they're not socialized, you don't want to get anywhere near an emu because they're so dangerous, but that's all I'll say about my emu. I don't but think I, we're going to be able to leave it there. Stuart. That's gonna no, what I was going to say there. is, can we trace a, a direct relationship or an equal sign between domestication and consciousness for that matter? We, we, are, the, we are the most country. domesticated animal. <laughs> I once did a long Twitter thread analyzing the book Brown Bear. What do you say? It's a great book. I highly recommend it. Many children's books really are wonderful on their own terms. But one of the things that I became aware of reading this, this book every night to my kids is the, the animals aren't looking at each other. The text goes, Brown Bear, what do you see? I see a red bird looking at me. But in fact, the red bird isn't looking at the brown bear, looking in the opposite direction. And so you can actually make quite a big deal about this kind of <laughs> observation philosophically that we want the animals to look at one another, but it's not. So anyways, yes, we teach children language, oftentimes with books. And those books often feature animals. And it's and actually one of the ways that kids learn language is by learning the sounds that animals make. But I think that your, my, my theory is that your indoctrinating is maybe too strong of a word. Inculcating, you're part of what it means for an infant, which is defined as a being without language, to join humanity is that they have to learn the difference between themselves and the animals. 
So you objectify the animals in the book to teach the child that you're a human being. And that means that you have language. And that's why you're learning how to read specifically to distinguish yourself from the animal. Also interesting yeah. to think about. The jungle book. I'm like right? a little bit maybe yeah. interpolating too much on this point. But like, this is a bombshell. So perhaps too sensitive a topic. But obviously in American history, slaves were forbidden from reading. Frederick Douglass and many talk about the liberating experience of learning to read, not just for the utilitarian function that you could, let's say, forge your papers or whatever, but the, that you get, you gain a certain access to self-consciousness and to the world through reading. So it seems like reading has also been weaponized historically as a dividing line between those who are full members of society and those who are animals or treated like animals which is why literacy is so important and often a leading indicator for social and economic progress. In more recent times, obviously women's literacy, let's say in places like Pakistan or Afghanistan, has been a, a major touching point. And obviously, so anyways. There's the argument that the printing press was the most important invention of yeah. history. But in, in ancient times, in ancient right. times, the scribes, were the only class that knew how to read and write. And for most of human history, reading and writing was a highly skilled privilege, if you will, and automatically puts you in the upper class. Whereas now, hopefully, the cost of reading and writing has gone down and more people can do it, and thus it's no longer a marker. It's no longer remarkable, but, but animals remind us that it is. Monkeys who write Shakespeare notwithstanding. I just want to say two things. One is that before there was uh, scripture, or let's say there was writing, you had language, or what we can call, let's say, parol, or just oral language. So if you look at today's example, which is for, comes from the Sanskrit, Sanskrit only had a, a script around, I would say, 2,000 years ago, but Sanskrit existed before that. It was oral, oral transmission. And Sanskrit is a highly inflected language. It has cases. So if you didn't know Sanskrit, and most people didn't, that's the whole point. Same thing with Latin. Uh, you couldn't engage in religion, call it religion, theology, law, politic, philosophy, grammar. Same thing happened with Latin. Uh, Greek is a kind of a, a more uh, complicated example, but the idea that it's not just the act of reading, it's what, you, what you're, it's not, sorry, it's not the, the act of learning a language, it's what language also. And language is not just English, Spanish, French. There's coding is a language, right? Yes. Or there's a language of code. I remember this was about 10 years ago. I saw an interview or read an interview with Bill Gates and they were asking Bill Gates, what would you study? Now, what would you, what language would you study in the future to be successful? And he gave a very interesting analysis is, look, in the 80s, or to say in the 70s, no, if you wanted to be successful, you would have to learn English because of global trade was starting. So if you didn't know English, you can, and global trade, it's just the British Empire. It has been a Tenanglo endeavor. No? Uh, after that, what was the next thing? It was learning how to use a computer. You get coding, you get now AI. So if you don't know how to use a computer, you won't be able to work. You won't be able to make money, et cetera, et cetera. And they asked him, what's the next? And he said, COVID, but like biogenetics. So like coding, like the genes, the gene code, learning how to do genetic coding. And I, I think it, I, there is something to that. And you see that today, coders, programmers make way more money. Oh, it's a much more desired skill than most skills. Now it might be changing with AI, but still to the asymmetries of learning in that regard. I have a, I don't know if this is contrarian or not, but I think that memes are the 21st century version of hieroglyphics. And I think that we're going to see more memes proliferate as a medium of communication, which is amazing that after so many years of actually abstracting from 
the image aspect of language, of written language, to the meaning aspect that we're actually returning to the literalism of the image. That is cool. There's I a meme of that it. already, Zohar. Damn. <laughs> yeah, you got to make a meme and put it in the Chronicle groups. Yeah, the, the, me, the me, uh, is, is memes are hieroglyphics, always has been. <laughs> aren't like literal just because they're imagery like the whole point of understanding memes is that you have to have like layers upon layers of cultural awareness so it's actually there's a lot more inference that happens with memes than even like text because you have to like do a lot of like understanding and asymmetrical connection to like mm. actually get the joke which makes so me wonder of, like, like sophisticated way of communicating <laughs> Which makes me wonder, is that how hieroglyphics used to work? Because it would only have been used by a priest class at the time, and they had all their traditions. And I think the, the distinction thought. there is that since maybe Plato onwards, or since the Greeks for the last 2,000, 2,500 years, because you look at someone like the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, and like a lot of his work is about this, that we have privileged speech over writing for a long time. And this is something happening in Plato. And once you get writing, it's at the detriment of memory and of a lot of other things, but memory. So once you start writing, the, your memory capacity wins. Yeah. And this is not something that, so writing itself is just a form of copy of yeah. what happens in the voice. No, that's the idea. The thing is that the whole thing, what's beautiful about Derrida is that his work is exactly, no, the writing itself is saying something different. Uh, and you can read, it's an inversion of the whole thing. And a lot of his inspiration comes from the Egyptians, the hierarchs, because that's exactly the, we don't know, I don't know to what extent, I'm not an expert in Egyptology or Papyrology or all these things, but it's the, um, it's a symbol in itself. It's not representing something that it's like, when you see, I don't know, a, a wolf, yeah. a hieroglyph of a wolf, it's not that the wolf is like the sound a. Eh. It's like Chinese works in a similar way, apparently, from what I understand. And so it's, it's all these things with language. It's not that easy. You think to say, okay, like writing is just the copy of a sound. Yeah. How did we get from a quote about the moon to talking about animals and wolves? And language. The, the modernity of the conversation <laughs> that the sun cannot dispel, the full moon can turn into a werewolf. Uh, anyways, guys, what a great conversation. Thank you for joining today. If you enjoyed the listen, again, check out the link in the bio. Join the Chronicles group, and there are discussions like this every day. It's awesome. Have a good one.